Initially, when I first uh, was asked by Kai to give a talk, I thought of just telling you a, a recent piece of research. But then I remembered that we are doing a quantum computing theme this year, plus also there's a panel discussion at the end. So instead, what I'm actually going to do is I'm not going to give you answers. I'm actually going to give you questions. Okay? I want to provide a bit of, um, uh, I want to say a few things that give you a bit more things to think about for our panel discussion later in the day. Huh? And the things I want to talk about uh, has to do with uh, why I have a question mark there, which is really the fact that um, there is perhaps a little bit of, uh, at least what I observe, a little bit of a disconnect between the theory of fault-tolerant quantum computing and what people are really thinking of doing in the lab today to implement uh, qubits for quantum computing purposes. Okay, so I want to sp uh, say a few words about that. So, um, maybe let me just start with uh, setting the stage of, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about, I will have a slide on what is quantum error correction and then a slide on what is uh, fault tolerant quantum computing and then I will get to all the things I want to complain about. Yeah? So, the first thing I start with is uh, when do you use quantum error correction and why do you think you might want to do that? Huh? Of course, the goal here is, um, so I'm not thinking about one, uh, one qubit or two qubit kind of devices. I'm really thinking long term, going to large scale, wanting to build a useful quantum computer. What are you going to use it for? You're going to use it to compute something that's uh, for a question that you care about, right? So at the end of the day, the computation should give you an answer that is accurate. It should be something that you can check and it should be something that uh, gives you the right answer more or less. Yeah? So what you want is to be able to do quantum information processing with high accuracy. Okay? So in order for you to do that, you need to be able to remove all the noise. We know that quantum systems are very susceptible to noise and you need to have some techniques to remove them. Right? So, what I've listed here is sort of uh, the basic noise fighting strategies that people have invented. And you start from the top. Uh, the way it, I've organized it is that what you have at the top is what you should do first. You exhaust all those options first before you move downwards. The further down the list you get, the more powerful is the noise remover uh, uh, ability. But the price you need to pay is also higher. Okay? So you start on top, of course, with uh, choosing the best experimental uh, architecture to build your qubit design, your basic qubits. Okay? If you don't have a good base technology, no amount of noise removal uh, strategies is going to be able to help you build an accurate uh, quantum computer in the end. Now, the next thing that you can do is what I will call passive noise protection. What I mean by this is passive in the sense that you don't really need to do anything uh, to it if you're lucky. Okay? And this is really looking for some sort of a symmetry inside your noise process, a symmetry so that there is some part of your quantum state space that is uh, perhaps the noise sees it as uh, all the states that are inside there. They see all the states as being identical, and then your noise process acts more or less as the identity. Okay? If you can find such a space, if you're lucky with it, you don't need to do anything. You just store your quantum information that you want to process in that region of the state space where your noise is identity, and then you will be, uh, you'll be home free. Yeah? Um, sometimes, most of the time, actually, you're not going to be so lucky. So what happens is that you will try to think about uh, ways of imposing the symmetry. Uh, some of these ideas of self-correcting quantum memories, uh, effective Hamiltonians to where the ground state is actually noise-free. These are uh, ideas that fall within this category. Yeah? I move on next to active noise removal. So this, the actives already suggest that you probably need to do something about it in order to remove the noise. And the active noise removal, the first class of it is uh, what I would call dynamical decoupling. Okay? These are usually pulses that you apply to your system. These are fast pulses you apply to your system to remove the effects of slow noise. Okay? You need to have this separation of scale. Because what these pulses actually do is that they average out the noise, and the averaging only works if your noise doesn't really change your qubit too much during the time that you're doing the averaging. Okay? So the dynamical decoupling um, aspects, this goes from the very simple, basic NMRO techniques of doing spin echoes, where you can only remove uh, one single kind of Pauli noise, and you can probably only remove it to some low perturbative order in some sense 
So nowadays we have uh, concatenated dynamical decoupling pulses, okay? And these are things that are highly complicated and many pulses that you need to do. But these have a lot of power. They can correct a uh, very a large class of uh, noise processes and to a very high order, okay? Last of all, I come to quantum error correction, which is really the thing that I want to focus on. So after you've done all the things above, okay, you are invariably going to have some residual noise left. And now this is sort of the last resort in a way, okay? You turn to quantum error correction because quantum error correction has the ability to correct arbitrary noise to a certain degree, yeah? Okay, so this is what I'm actually going to, I need to qualify this a little bit. So quantum error correction is what you do at the end, um, but it's also not the cure-all, okay? Quantum error correction corrects noise usually in some sort of a noise category. For example, if you have independent noise, um, the noise on your qubits occur independently. You choose codes that are suitable for that. If you have correlated noise, you choose codes that are uh, related, that are able to correct correlated noise, okay? It also doesn't remove all errors. It removes errors up to a certain maximum strength, okay? But hopefully, if you choose a powerful enough code, um, you will be able to remove enough errors such that you reduce the noise of your quantum computation below the level that you actually care about. And all of this comes at the cost. I, I told you that it gets more expensive as you pro progress down the list. It comes as a cost because to do error correction, you need to put in more resources. You need more qubits, you need to do more gates, okay? And in the previous slide, actually what I've done, I've not mentioned this, but what I'm actually assuming is that all the things that you do to remove the noise, you are able to do those operations without any noise, okay? But actually, the same things that you do, the, all those gates that you apply, or the pulses that you apply for the dynamical decoupling, these are essentially the same processes that are noisy, the same ones that you are trying to uh, make weaker in noise for the computation. Okay, so this actually brings us to this idea of fault tolerance, huh? and I'm gonna tell you sort of why we need to think about fault tolerance. So if you do quantum error correction, um, your quantum circuit typically looks something like this, okay? You have an input state and then you have gate operations, you have preparation, you have measurement operations. So all these computational operations now are actually things that are acting on the encoded space, okay? Because you are doing error correction now, all your logical information, all your actual information you want to process is actually in the code space itself, not all over the Hilbert space. So your gate operations, your preparation, your measurements, these are all encoded operations, okay? And they usually involve many physical qubits, require many physical gates to, uh, to complete. And one thing that you need to do is, of course, uh, you want to think about the fact that, well, if I have many physical qubits that I need to couple together to complete an encoded gate operation, what you want to do is you want to do your encoder gate operation in a manner that doesn't spread errors everywhere, okay? You don't want a fault that occurs in one of your physical qubits, and then because you're coupling it to so many other qubits, that same fault that occurs that causes an error is going to spread its error to all the other qubits that it gets coupled to, okay? So one of the main ideas of fault tolerance is actually to design your encoded gate operations, your preparation, your measurement in a manner that actually minimizes the spread of errors, okay? So this is the idea of transversal gates, if you're familiar with it. Now, interspersed with all these gate operations, preparation and then the measurements are actually what you see as red uh, error correction operations, okay? You have to do error correction regularly. It's not something that you do right at the beginning or right at the end only. You have to do it regularly in order for you to be able to correct the errors as they happen, okay? So every single cycle of error correction corrects all the errors that have occurred since the last cycle of error correction, okay? So you cannot wait very long because if you wait very long, the amount of errors that, you have, uh, that has happened since the last cycle will accumulate and then after a while you exceed the ability of uh, the correction ability of your actual error correcting code, okay? So you need to do this error correction to remove errors periodically, yeah? But as I mentioned at the beginning of this slide is that the error correction operations are themselves also noisy, okay? If you open up these boxes, 
for error correction, you see that they're built from the same gate that you would use to do your computational operations. Okay. So the question actually is, are we actually adding noise or are we actually removing noise? Okay. So if you use error correction, I've already said that the benefit of using error correction is that you can remove errors okay, up to a certain strength, provided the error correction itself has no faults. Okay, that's the benefit of doing error correction. Comes at a cost. What is the cost? It comes at the cost of an increased complexity of the circuit. Okay, complexity here, I'm using in the pedestrian or English word sense that I just mean that you have more elements inside your circuit now. Okay, you have more elements because now your actual quantum um, information that you want to process is now encoded in many physical qubits, not just one qubit. Your operations, I said that they are encoded operation. Each encoded operation is comprised of many physical operations. Okay, so you might you wind up with a circuit that has many more circuit elements than if you don't do error correction. That's the cost. Okay, and why is that a cost? Really, you have more. You have a larger, more complex circuit. You also have many more things that can go wrong. Okay, so again, I ask this question: Are we actually adding or are we actually removing noise? Now. Um, Fault tolerance itself is really a cost-benefit analysis in this sense, okay? You think about when is it that the cost of doing error correction is lower than the benefit, the fact that you can actually remove some errors, okay? That's when I will say that uh, you're below the threshold. What, what kind of threshold do I mean? A noise threshold. You think about the fact that your gate operations are noisy and there's a certain level of noise, if your gate operations are very noisy, probably you don't want to do error correction because doing error correction means that you need to touch it more. You need to touch your quantum system more, okay? So if your gate operations are very noisy, you don't want to touch them so much, then probably error correction is not something that is going to work well. Now, once you're below, once your gate noise is below a certain level, you think that perhaps there is a chance that the benefit of being able to remove some noise is going to outweigh the cost of increased complexity, okay? So below the noise threshold is sort of when this cost, um, probably I should have turned it the other way around, isn't it? You should say benefit actually outweighs the cost. Okay, that's what people mean when they talk about the fault tolerance threshold. A second part that comes together with this assurance of being below the noise threshold is actually a scaling assurance. It assures you that once you're below the noise threshold, you can also increase the code size, increase the power of your error correcting ability, increase the size of your circuit, and by doing that, actually increase the accuracy of your quantum computation. Okay, so this is what being below the noise threshold actually assures you. Now, there are two main code schemes actually for fault tolerance that people talk about today. Um, I classify them according to, so on the left side you have concatenator codes, the other side you have surface codes. They are classified according to how you scale up your code to become more powerful and more accurate, okay? Um, the concatenator codes one, what you actually do is you scale up by concatenating, which just means that you treat the logical qubits at each level of encoding as the physical qubits for the next level of error correction encoding, okay? For the surface codes, on the other hand, um, I sort of drawn a picture of it, all the circles are actually your qubits, okay? And then um, the the crosses are operations that you need to do. But you see that there is a rate on a surface. It's actually usually, a, uh, it doesn't have to be a 2D surface. It depends on what kind of code you're using. But essentially, these codes work according to the fact that um, a logical error, meaning something that happens to the information that you store in it, a logical error occurs when an error chain actually spans the entire lateral dimension of your code. Okay. So if you have a code that's actually bigger, it's more resilient to logical errors because your error chains need to be longer, which you hope is a rarer event, okay? So that's really the two broad classifications of the codes. And what are the features that they have? The one on the left, uh, concatenator codes are sort of well known to have high ancilla overheads. What I mean by this is ancillas are really extra qubits that you need in order for you to be able to do your error correction, okay? So for a concatenated code, the ratio of extra ancillas that you need compared to the ones that you actually need to store the information, this is sort of a terrible uh, number. If I 
point at this. Uh, wait. Ah, okay, this actually works. So if I look at this, uh, this is sort of a, a typical gate operation. This is actually a logical C0 operation in one of the very well-known codes uh, under this category of concatenated codes. So if you look at this, actually the data qubits, the ones that store your actual information, is this and this, okay? And then there's a logical C0 gate in between. Each of these lines is not one physical qubit. At the lowest level of encoding, it's actually seven physical qubits. And then you see that there are all these extra ones. The extra ones are the ancillas. Each of the lines, again, is seven qubits. So you see that you, have, you need four sets of ancilla qubits to one set of data qubit for this particular code. Okay, very high ancilla overheads. Huh? Um, there are schemes nowadays where you can trade off this ancilla overhead uh, with time, but it, if you, the, why this is not necessarily a good thing is that the longer you wait, the more errors occur. Okay, so this trade-off with time may not actually be so good. On the other side, you have lower and slower overheads, and this is usually 50%. Okay, 50% of your qubits on this picture, actually, I don't remember, either the blank ones or the black ones are actually the data qubits, and then the rest are ancillary qubits. Okay, so much better and slow overhead on this side. This side, concatenated codes, you need non-local operations in order to be able to do any gate. Surface codes, you need only local operations. In fact, the only gates that you need to do are nearest neighbors ones, okay, between uh, neighboring circles. Um, so surface codes, however, have this problem of complicated uh, decoding, okay? What is decoding? Decoding is essentially when you do error correction, you make some measurements, you get some classical outcomes that you need to then uh, try to interpret to figure out what is the error that has actually occurred. Thereafter, you can apply a recovery, yeah? Okay, so you need to do syndrome decoding in order for you to be able to do error correction. Surface code, um, the decoding itself is a complicated process, but it's a classical problem, actually, okay? And we have seen, actually, a lot of advances in terms of coming out with good decoding schemes for surface codes. In contrast, for concatenated codes, decoding is completely straightforward and trivial, okay? Um, and then I come to the last point, is, which is actually the one I want to spend a bit more time on, which is the fact that one of the main arguments why is it that most of the architectures that people are pursuing right now for building quantum computers, they are all using surface code, okay? The main reason for that is because of this last point. The fact that your, non, your local operations here, of course, helps a lot, but I think, in my opinion, a lot of the uh, why is it that people really were convinced that they want to do surface code rather than concatenator code has to do with the threshold. If you look at the noise threshold numbers between the two, which is what I have on the next slide, you will get the sense that perhaps the surface code ones really have much less demanding noise thresholds. Okay, less demanding noise thresholds essentially just means that you don't need to get your noise as much under control under the surface code scenario than for the concatenated code ones, okay? So let me go to this slide. Can see, um, can see this? Okay, I think the screen is actually large enough. So um, what I've done is I've put up all the, well, okay, certainly not all, but a lot of the representative threshold calculations, this fault tolerance noise thresholds, uh, that people have done over the years. The top half of the table are concatenated codes, the lower half are surface codes, okay? And um, so within each category of codes, you see that there are many variants, okay? Uh, I've put down the kind of noise uh, description that they use in these threshold studies. And then the actual threshold number, this particular column, Actually, the way to understand those numbers, you should think of them as probability of error per gate, okay? If you can get your probability of error per gate below this number, you are in business. You are going to be able to do fault-tolerant quantum computing, at least according to these papers, huh? Um, I will come back to this about the remarks momentarily. A little post-it that, that gathers the kind of things I need to tell you. Okay, so first one. Noise models, I already mentioned that you have a whole array of noise models that is being tried out. Um, oh, before I do that, I should point out that if you look at the numbers itself, I'll just look at the threshold numbers, you'll find that the threshold numbers for the concatenated codes are typically 10 to the power of minus four. There's a 10 to the power of minus two one that really uses so many ancillas that no one ever thinks is going to be practical, okay? And then if you look at the surface code numbers, ignore the lower 
two lines for the moment. The surface code numbers are something like 10 to the power of minus 3 or better. Okay, so this is the first impression that everyone gets that perhaps surface codes are a little bit better than co uh, concatenated codes when it comes to uh, thresholds. Okay. Now, let me say a little bit about the noise. How much time do I have? Okay, I have about 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, good. Let me say a little bit about the noise. If you look at the noise, the lower part of it, all of it says depolarizing noise, okay? Depolarizing noise is actually what people will usually consider uh, as the mildest form of noise, okay? On the top half, you will see that there are things that there are some depolarizing noise ones, but there are also things that look like adversarial noise. The adversarial noise uh, to people in this business essentially is the nastiest kind of noise that you can possibly imagine, okay? So you see that already the kind of noise models that you discuss are rather different. Now, um, there is also a difference between the threshold numbers for the concatenated codes ones and for the surface codes. For the concatenated code schemes, actually all those numbers are theoretical bounds. And they are theoretical bounds in the sense of worst case bounds. Okay? This is in contrast to some of the numbers below. I actually say this in this column. Some of this is numerical experiment. The ones I see in numerical experiment, actually what you expect is they are not worst case bounds. They are actually typical case bounds meaning that you do an, a, a numerical experiment on your classical computer, you run this many times and see when is it that your error correction is actually successful, okay? If you do things that way, you are never gonna get the rare cases that gives you the worst case bounce, okay? So there's a difference between the numbers here. Now, for the concatenator code ones, you see everything says logical C0. I have a memory only that I will come back to. But everything on the concatenated code one says logical C0, surface code one say memory only. This is another difference between these threshold numbers. For the concatenated codes, people have thought about really um, even doing actual logical gates. You compute the number for logical C0 because this is usually the one that is the worst, the nastiest element in their entire computation. Okay, whereas for the surface code one, the only calculations that people have ever done are for memory only, yeah? no kind of logical operations, just storage. Now, I come back to these last two lines actually, 17 qubit rotated surface code and 19 qubit color code. Um, the 17 qubit rotated surface code is essentially what everyone in the world who's thinking about building a quantum computer is trying to do, okay? And uh, 19 qubit color code is sort of a, a variant on that, that uh, also it only requires 19 qubits. If you take a look at these numbers, actually they don't look so great, okay? And this I can tell you is actually the numbers that you are facing right now if you are thinking of building a 17 qubit quantum computer that demonstrates uh, memory or storage with a surface code, okay? And why are these numbers actually worse than the ones above? I should first say that these numbers here really only work for 17 qubits, works for 19 qubits only. There is no statement about scaling, okay? So very often nowadays, people try to differentiate these sort of numbers um, from the ones above by saying that these are called pseudo thresholds. They don't care about scaling. They are computed just for a fixed size code. The ones above actually talk about scaling. It really tells you this fact that um, once you're below the noise threshold, then actually the, you, are, you are able to scale up your computer and be able to get more and more accurate calculation. Okay, so again, there's a difference. And if you take a look at this, um, these numbers are really not looking so pleasant right now, isn't it? Um, oh, I missed one. Uh, there's also something about the surface code one of, the most, uh, one of the earliest numbers for surface codes that really convinced everyone that the threshold was, uh, is uh, much less demanding is really this part that says planar surface code. Oh, I have a laser pointer. Yeah. Planar surface code, and then this number that says 10%. Okay, 10 power minus one is 10%, right? I'm not getting this wrong, huh? Okay, it says 10%, and then there's, uh, there are variants of it that gets smaller and smaller. What are all these differences? The first numbers are really computed as if your error correction operations are perfect. Okay, so this goes back to just thinking of it as well. There's something unusual about my quantum error correction uh, operations. I don't need to care about noise for them. Huh? That's how you get this 10%. 
Once you take the noise into account in the error correction operations, you're back to this 10 to the power minus 3 numbers. And even this, if you use a worst case bound, actually you get 10 to the power minus 4, which is then comparable with the one above. Yeah? Okay. So don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that the surface code numbers, uh, the threshold numbers are not, um, not less demanding than the ones for concatenated codes. I'm simply saying that on the surface, when you look at it now, there really isn't that big of a difference. Okay, it's also not quite a fair comparison because surface codes are really much newer. Threshold calculations are much more recent thing for surface codes than for concatenated codes. Okay, so I would just say that maybe we should be a little bit uh, reserved right now in terms of concluding which has a better threshold. Huh? Okay, let me spend the last few minutes telling you about all my other complaints. Um, so I've already said that the uh, threshold numbers uh, between surface codes, between concatenated codes, right now it's hard to draw a nice conclusion as to which one is better. Okay? Um, of greater concern to experimentalists is also the fact that what exactly is the number that you should target for. Okay? If I go back to just uh, this 17 qubit numbers, the number that you actually need is something at 10 to the power minus 4. Okay, is that the best number that we can have? Can we come up with a better scheme that actually has uh, better numbers? And then the other thing that you need to do is also to benchmark. Because, because the table that I've shown you shows that depending on which study you look at, all the things that they put into the calculation is somewhat different. You get numbers that are not really comparable whatsoever. Yeah? So you need some, of, some sort of a benchmarking. Uh, in terms of the tasks that you do and perhaps also the resources that you put into that calculation. Um, some of the other things, I don't think I will go through every single one of this, but uh, the second part has to do with noise model assumptions. Noise model assumptions, these are basic assumptions that you need to put into your threshold calculations or threshold proofs. And these are, there is usually some sort of uh, assumption about what is the nature of the noise. For example, local noise assumption is one. Very often you assume that it's Markovian in nature, and you also assume that the strength of your noise is independent of the size of the computer. Is this actually true in reality? And how do you actually verify these uh, assumptions in the lab itself when you actually have a device that is working? Strength of the noise being independent of the size of a computer, this is really something that I sort of question whether or not we can get that to be true. Is it really? Uh, are you really able to get the same quality of qubits when you have a 9 qubit processor as compared to a 72 qubit one? Okay, this is sort of the question that you need to ask yourself. Huh? Now, the next point um, says free resources are not actually free. I point this out because uh, many of these threshold calculations, threshold proofs, they were invented at a time when the question was not about is it practically feasible to build a quantum computer? These threshold proofs were invented when the question was, is it even physically possible in principle to build these quantum computers? Okay? So because of that, many of these proofs make use of uh, things that we call free resources. You think that there's an infinite flow of clean and ancillaries that you can use. You think that your classical computer is infinitely fast. If that were true, we wouldn't be thinking of building a quantum computer. And you think of things like uh, free classical communication with your computer that is outside of your quantum computer. Okay? So many of these things are actually swept under the rug in quantum um, fault tolerance proofs and calculations. And we need to think about this when you are trying to really build this in the lab. Okay? And then this a couple more things. Huh? And the question is, what else uh, uh, is there to worry about? So my take home message, I'm at the end already. So my take home message for the talk really is the following. Um, there's a lot to be pleased about with the current state of technology. As we've heard talks of people making very good progress in making physical qubits that go towards building a quantum computer. The question, however, is whether or not we can scale this. Yeah? Um, all along, the theoretical assurance that we can scale to large computers is actually useful. This comes from really this fault tolerance kind of uh, ideas. Once you get your noise under control, you can always make useful computers. What I'm hoping to point out right now is there is still quite a bit of work to be done to bring this theory, theoretical idea of fault tolerance towards practical implementations in the lab. Okay? So I'm going to leave you with this and make an advertisement. Anyone wants to work on this, I have postdoc and PhD positions available. Thank you.